You should have just watched the video on abiogenesis, which attempted to explain in the same way that Aristotle attempted to explain the rainstorm, a naturalistic explanation for how life could arise from non-life. At this point, we've overcome two hurdles towards a naturalistic explanation for the question, why are we here? First, how did the universe come to be here? Is the only explanation that a god did it? Or is there any other possible explanation? Second, why is there life? Or why is life here? Is the only possible explanation that a god did it? Or could there be a naturalistic rather than a supernatural explanation? And then once we have a universe and we have life in the universe, the last thing we need to do is understand Darwin's theory for how life evolves to understand the transition or the process by which life became more than just single cellular colonies into multicellular animals even animals with intelligence, language, and rationality, such as ourselves. The picture you see now is Staphylothermus marinus. It's an extremophile found in deep ocean hydrothermal vents, found thriving on volcanic sulfur, and surviving in water temperatures near the boiling point. This cell almost perfectly mirrors that described in the video on abiogenesis. The scientific attempt to explain naturalistically the development of life after its origin is much more well understood single-celled life gave rise to multicellular organisms um, such as the fungus you see here a multicellular colony or a sea sponge the sea sponge is an a simple organism that's nearly halfway between plants and animals in fact understanding its reproductive life cycle may help us understand the origin of animals and their divergence from plants. The larva of a sea sponge swims freely in the ocean, very similar to how a maple seed from a maple tree falls and spins through the air, carrying it on the air currents farther away from the base of, tree, of the tree to start a new organism in a suitable location. In the ocean, something similar can be accomplished by a simple pulsation, very similar to how a jellyfish pulsates to move quite unintelligently through the water column. All that would be required is for this sea sponge larva to stay in the juvenile form throughout its life cycle and we would have the transition from plants to animals just that simplistically. This is a picture of the larva of an ocean worm that resembles a plant in its adulthood. It swims and crawls on the ocean floor before rooting in a suitable, in a suitable location. I think this creature looks something like a something like Dr. Zoidberg from Futurama, 
with all those little mouth tentacles there. But even more realistically, it's a jellyfish. It's a jellyfish that in its late life, life cycle uh, roots in a location and stays there much more like a plant. Thus illustrating the relationship between the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. But we want to know, how does speciation occur? And if you study the evolutionary science, there are a handful of ways in which speciation does predominantly occur. Let's identify them. The first would be through geographic separation. So if you have, let's say, one type of fish, let this line represent one type of fish. And then one body of water becomes two bodies of water. That split population of fish could evolve along separate evolutionary routes just through random genetic drift or differential evolutionary pressures. And thus, one species could become two species. And if these two bodies of water ever joined back up, if those two species could no longer interbreed, they would have speciated. This process can occur and occur and occur. But there are other mechanisms by which speciation occurs as well. Another would be ecological specialization. For example, if you have sea sponges, which find their food drifting by on the sea floor, and jellyfish, which find their food up in the water column, then you could have two different species evolving from one another in the same geographical location if they're eating different foods. This is likely how humans and apes such as chimpanzees and gorillas originally separated from each other. In one location in Africa you could have chimpanzees and gorillas living in the forests or perhaps even living in the trees and you could have early human ancestors moving out into the savannas or living on the forest floor so that in one location if different types of foods are being exploited two different species could emerge from one The third way in which speciation may occur, most generally, is in an ecological relationship or a food web relationship, what we might call symbiosis or parasitism. In this case, one organism would rely on another or one species would rely on another for food. So that if there are fish that are eating jellyfish, if the fish eat all the jellyfish, exhausting their food source, the fish go extinct along with the jellyfish. This is how you have predator and prey relationships, and is another way in which speciation can occur. I would encourage you to investigate on your own evolutionary speciation. While it may indeed be possible to critique evolutionary theory and science, one would have to do so from within the scientific discipline itself, understanding precisely the mechanisms by which it is thought that these things work. More simply, 
without understanding in detail the theory and the evidence behind the theory, there's no way to criticize it realistically. So the story of evolution from here is one of speciation. From single-celled organisms arise multicellular organisms. The multicellular organisms proceed along a couple different paths. One path has radial symmetry. This would be in organisms like starfish or jellyfish, which are organized around a central axis. The other would be organisms with bilateral symmetry. That is organized on either side of a line. The simplest of these would be sea cucumbers. They've got a front, a back, a top, a bottom, a left, and a right side. From simple sea cucumbers come things like leeches. From leeches, lungfish, lampreys. From leeches and lampreys, the true fish. From fish, amphibians, such as the mudskipper, which can survive on land. Uh, or salamanders, uh, newts, and skinks, and um, from there, frogs, which have a watery tadpole phase and a, 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 a liminal frog phase, where they exist in wet, watery environments and can't exist well if they dry out. From these amphibians, the first reptiles, which can exist in drier environments, evolve. From those, the dinosaurs, as well as early mammal-like reptiles, such as a group called the monotremes. Monotremes are things like uh, platypuses and inchida. These are mammal-like creatures, marsupials, many of which lay eggs, but also have mammary glands that nurse. For the Inkita, for example, instead of having a, a nipple like a, a dog or a pig or a human, platypuses and Inkitas have a patch of skin which lactates instead of a, a localized bit of skin that releases nutrient for the young. In fact, the reason why possums and rats have long scaly tails is precisely because that is an evolutionary holdover from the reptile kingdom. Now, from the dinosaurs, we have the evolution of the birds. And in fact, we have the transitional fossils that represent this evolution. The most well-known is called Archaeopteryx. There's a, a famous Hollywood child star by the name of Kirk Cameron, who famously argued that if evolution is true, we should have a crocoduck. Half crocodile, half duck. In fact, we do. That's precisely what we found in fossil deposits in China. Birds with teeth and dinosaur heads. The reason why chickens and ostriches and crows and eagles all have 
scaly dinosaur feet. And why Triceratops, for example, has a beak. Um, and some, if not all, ducks have teeth is that there is a clear and well understood evolutionary relationship between dinosaurs and birds. In fact, specifically, the scientific understanding now is that the dinosaurs did not go extinct. They evolved into birds. And only the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. Let's deal with one other issue before we go too far, which is that people want to know, if humans evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Our explanation of speciation actually explains why. But there is another answer that might also help be satisfying, which is that before very long, there won't be any monkeys. The chimpanzees and gorillas are near extinction. The rainforest habitats of monkeys around the world are being deforested. The real reason why, if humans evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Is just give it a little bit of time. There won't be any more monkeys. We will have outcompeted them. We will have exploited our environment and adapted to it and it to us better than they have. So that your intuition is correct. If we're better evolved than them, why don't we drive them to extinction? The truth is, we are. We are doing precisely that. But there is a correct intuition in there uh, involving if um, dinosaurs evolved into birds, why are there still crocodiles? And that's tough. But I would encourage you to go back to our opening discussion of speciation to understand um, geographical se separation, ecological speci specialization, and ecological relationships. And that should sufficiently explain the answer to that question. One last thing that we can identify in here is the age-old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? There's probably a right answer to that. In evolutionary terms, the egg came first. Eggs are ancient. Dinosaurs lay eggs, we know because we have them fossilized. Fish lay eggs. Turtles and all sorts of reptiles lay eggs. For millions of years before there were ever chickens, eggs existed in various many species on planet Earth. It's the chicken that's new and recent. The egg is very old. In terms of evolutionary, I'm sorry, in terms of transitional fossils, we also have the complete fossil record for the evolution of horses from things about the size of mice or small dogs, um, of dolphins from animals quite like otters and before that even wolves, and from dolphins to whales, as well as the entire evolutionary history of humanity. From apes to bipedal apes, such as Australopithecus, to early members of the genus Homo, 
such as Homo erectus and eventually Neanderthal. And lastly, Homo sapiens. For other examples of evolutionary processes in action, you can look at the artificial selection rather than natural selection that results in the various breeds of domesticated dogs. In a few thousand years, wolves have been bred from everything into St. Bernards and German Shepherds and Great Danes into toy pugs, Boston Terriers, and Chihuahuas. Or perhaps you're aware in the medical industry of a disease called, I'm sorry, a bacteria called MRSA, M-R-S-A. MRSA is multiple resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And it is a form of bacteria that's highly resistant to all sorts of antibiotics. It has evolved a resistance. It's like if you wash your hand with antibacterial soap. And the soap says on the bottle, kills 99.99% of germs. Those germs that survive and repopulate your hand are those that were randomly more able to resist the antibacterial. You wash your hands again and you're selecting for those stronger, hardier bacteria and germs. And again and again and again until you have superbugs, super germs, and antibiotic resistant uh, microorganisms. As we move from the earliest mammals towards ourselves, we go from things that look like rats, furry bodies, scaly tails, to squirrels, things that look like squirrels, so that in a very real way, if you see a squirrel in your yard, you are looking at an evolutionary cousin across 50 mil million years of speciation. From squirrels, things that look more like cats, from cats, things that look more like monkeys, from monkeys to apes, until we have the great apes that we're aware of today. Big muzzle, big brow, small brain. Look at this chimpanzee mother here. Do you think she loves her infant? She certainly displays behavior as if she does. If that is the case, it might make a difference ethically in terms of the way we treat these animals. All that's required now is simply shortening the pelvis bone so that way we can stand upright and have Australopithecus. Animals whose bipedal gait we have fossil evidence for as seen in this reconstruction here. To learn more about evolutionary theory, I do recommend this video by Carl Sagan a text called An Ancestor's Tale by Richard Dawkins, or any class in evolutionary biology, 
once we have bipedalism, it doesn't take long to have tool use. There are many tool using organisms, uh, crows, but also more notably a number of monkeys and apes like chimpanzees. Once human ancestors are chipping stones to make arrowheads and axes, all it would take is one to be chipping on a piece of flint and the ability to create fire is discovered. At some point after this, likely, if not before, language would have emerged from pre-linguistic forerunners in animal communication. And human languages are especially interesting because of their syntax and recursive structure. Syntax means there is a word order in English, subject, verb, object. In some other languages, subject, object, verb. It's grammar. And also, these languages are recursive, which means that I can add clauses on top of clauses into my sentences to extend and modify their meaning infinitely. Because of these two features, grammatical structure and recursiveness, Human languages are effectively infinite. There is an infinite variety of things that can be said in human languages. And this is likely very beneficial for us. Once we have tools, bipedal posture, fire, and language to plan and coordinate with, a number of prehistoric megafauna go extinct, Mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths, moa more recently. Likely either because of direct hunting by humans or being outcompeted or habitat change from human uh, activities. The domestication of plants and animals would occur. This is the emergence of agriculture, then cities and trade, which agriculture makes possible. Somewhere along here, money would have been invented. And finally, as a means of keeping track of agriculture, trade, and money would have been writing. Once writing exists, we've moved from prehistory into recorded history and the dawn of human civilization. And that's it. A story starting 13 and a half billion years ago with the origin of this universe starting three and a half to four billion years ago with the origin of life on Earth, a few million to a few hundred thousand years ago with the origin of human life, and 10,000 years ago with civilization as we know it. This is a brand new phase in human evolutionary history and in the evolution of life on Earth. Many extinctions have occurred before. We're in the middle of a great one now that we are explicitly causing. What remains to be seen is how we deal with this unprecedented phase of terrestrial organic history. One thing of hope might be expressed by the neuroscientist and sociologist Steven Pinker in a huge text titled The Better Angels of Our Nature. Pinker argues, based on solid uh, observational evidence, that 
even though through mass media we have the ability to see the violence humanity is capable of inflicting on each other and the world around us. This is, in fact, the least violent period in human history. After World War I and World War II, great nation-states have largely ceased going to war against each other, with relatively small exceptions. And furthermore, that we are ourselves in the process of domesticating each other. A Russian biologist was able to display evolution in action by domesticating silver foxes from wild foxes. But the same process is going on every single time we make a reproductive choice or a mate selection in our daily lives. Largely, we're choosing to reproduce with people who are significantly nonviolent. Imagine if you had to choose between mating with a person who's a serial killer or won the Nobel Peace Prize. I think we all know who would be more likely to reproduce and who we'd be more likely to want to reproduce with. Those people who are exceptionally violent and combative are being bred out unintentionally and unconsciously, but realistically. And that might be a reason to hope that in evolutionary terms, war may not be an inevitability for humanity. And that's unexpected. However, those evolutionary processes are long and slow, and the environmental challenges we face, such as environmental destruction, um, climate change or global warming, and overpopulation, those are issues that we'll need addressing quickly. But before we deal with all of that, let's take some time to figure out how we got here. We'll begin that with the next video.